It's a story of religion, betrayal, sex, and murder. A story with multiple layers of deceit and the deaths of five people, all connected to one woman, Lori Daybell. But it all began when Kay and Larry Woodcock were concerned about the well-being of their little grandson, JJ. Kay and Larry were in Louisiana, and their grandson was with his adoptive mom, Lori Daybell, in Idaho after Lori's brother, Alex, shot and killed her husband, JJ's dad, Charles Vallow, in Arizona. Larry and Kay kept in contact with JJ through FaceTime calls, but when the call stopped and Lori started acting strangely, Larry and Kay called police. What happened next was the search for two children, the death of the wife of Lori's new husband, Chad, the death of Lori's brother who killed her fourth husband, and finally, the discovery of JJ's remains and his sister Tylee's remains in Chad's backyard. Lori went to trial for the murder of her children and her fifth husband's first wife. She was convicted and is now locked up in Arizona waiting for her murder trial for the shooting of husband number four, Charles. Meanwhile, husband number five, Chad, is on trial for murdering his first wife, Tammy, and his second wife's two youngest children. And tonight, we'll take a look at the money trail, which followed the murder trail. And we'll look at two more shootings. Were they connected to Chad? Were they connected to Lori? Were they connected to her brother, Alex? All this as we continue our investigation of the Doomsday Couple. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you for joining us tonight on Closing Arguments. And if this is the first time you've ever come across this story, what a story it is. And if it's not your first time, I think each time we talk about the Doomsday Couple and what transpired here, we need to take a moment to remember how many different people are involved, how many people died, and how layered all of this is as Chad Daybell now is on trial in front of a jury in Idaho. Let's begin with Lori. Five husbands for her. Very complicated life for this woman. Married early, married early again, married her third husband. That one lasted a little bit longer. Um, then her fourth husband, that lasted a little bit longer. And then her fifth husband, um, who is now on trial, Chad Daybell. Husband number four is dead. Husband number three is dead. Three, it's not clear exactly how he died, but it was suspicious. But no one's been charged with any crime for that one. Although her brother did physically assault him uh, previously. Uh, but husband number four, it's clear. She's charged with his murder. And Alex, her brother, shot and killed him with a gun. He admitted it, but claimed it was self-defense. So five husbands. We're also talking about four murders, though. We'll go through them again. I'll go left to right. Charles Vallow. That is husband number four of Lori Daybell. Unresolved case in Arizona. Lori will stand trial. Her co-defendant and all that is dead. So Alex. So that's not relevant. But Lori will stand trial for that murder. Then there's little J.J., he was buried in Chad Daybell's backyard, as was his sister, but his sister had been, uh, her body had been burnt, and she was placed in a pet cemetery, her remains. Sick, sick stuff. And then there's Tammy Daybell. Prosecutors say it was a murder. The jury agreed in the case involving Lori Daybell, but now Chad Daybell's on trial for that same murder, and he's claiming that it wasn't a murder at all. It was some form of natural causes. She just died. But we're talking about four murders here. Lori's been found guilty of three, will stand trial for the fourth. Chad, standing trial for three, will not stand trial for the murder of Charles Vallow. Now, something else you should know, and, and this doesn't get as much publicity, we're gonna talk about it a lot tonight. There were three shootings. There were three shootings in all of this. Charles Vallow was shot and killed. That's the one we always talk about. But uh, a man named Brandon Boudreau, who was married to Lori's niece, was shot at. His life was almost taken. He survived. And that shooting came um, prior to the children 
the search for the children and the children being found in the backyard, um, but clearly is one that put Lori on the radar of, of law enforcement, even before the children are reported missing or are seemingly gone. Then there was a shooting involving Tammy Daybell. Yeah, she was shot out. Now, she died in the marital bed, either murdered or died of natural causes, according to Chad Daybell. But like 10 days before that, someone was shooting at her. Now, she wasn't sure exactly what was going on. She thought maybe it was paintballs or something. But someone came by with a gun and was firing things at her. 10 days before she died of natural causes. That's the defense case. And in all of this, two defendants, two defendants. Now, there would have been three defendants, uh, but one of them died on the toilet. Uh, that's Lori's brother, Alex. So he's gone, and no one's charged with anything uh, regarding his death. Although, like anyone dies here, it should be looked at and then looked at again. Uh, but two defendants, Lori, who has been found guilty, We'll stand trial in Arizona, another state for another murder, and Chad, who's on trial right now, front and center. And each day we are seeing and hearing a lot of evidence, some of it's similar, obviously, to the evidence against Lori Daybell, but some very specific differences as well. Today was another big day. Today was about the money. Let's take a look. Uh, in November 27th of 2019, I was aware that uh, then Detective from Seal, who's now a lieutenant, uh, he was uh, conducting surf, uh, search warrants. In late December of 2019, I got information from Gilbert Police Department in Arizona that uh, Lori Vallow had a uh, P.O. box in Sugar City, Idaho, just uh, outside Rexburg. There was a large uh, bundle of unopened mail, uh, approximately 100 pieces or so. They were um, addressed to both Lori uh, Vallow and her then uh, husband, Charles Vallow, who was, was uh, deceased, uh, and her brother, Lori, uh, excuse me, Alex Cox. So we served uh, several warrants and subpoenas to uh, different financial institutions and um, the cellular device companies. It shows uh, Tylee is very active on this account. She is receiving death benefit stipends in this account from uh, her father, who Joe Ryan, who passed away. When you say active, well, she was out spending money uh, almost on a daily basis. She was going to convenience stores, gas stations, shopping centers, fast food. So it shows Tylee moving from Arizona, heading north. And this is the same time frame when they were moving to Idaho. Her last in-person use of a card was done in St. George, Utah on the 1st. We had learned that in the middle of August, I believe it was August 16th, Lori, uh, Tylee's mom, had contacted Social Security and had stopped having the monthly stipends deposited into Tylee's account. And she then switched those monies to be posited in to her own personal account, Lori's personal account from the BBVA. So there were no more funds coming into this account at all. Here we see a credit for Social Security Treasury deposit for $1,859. Uh, this account is, a, this deposit is associated to Tylee Ryan. And where was Tylee Ryan receiving her Social Security benefits before that? As stated, she was previously receiving them in her JP Chase account which her mother has since closed down, August 28th of 2019. And was there anything significant about that to you, about that date? We learned that our investigation, we believe that Tylee was killed 10 days later. We see the C1, so that would be for JJ, and that's the monies that were received. And detective, was there anything significant about that deposit date to you? Yes. 
J.J. was killed a few days later. A screenshot of an email that was sent from Mr. Daybell to Kauai Dreams, really. We are interested in seeing this property. Would the owners be interested in leasing this property to a clean couple with no pets or children? And so at this time in your investigation, had you been able to locate Kylie or JJ? No. Money, power, and sex. Today, all about the money. Kelly Craft, Court TV legal correspondent, joining us live from outside the courthouse in Boise, Idaho tonight. Kelly, great to see you. Um, all right, let's go through some of these financials. Let's start with Lori Daybell. What did we learn about her financials today? Well, hi there, Vinny. Well, we learned a lot. It really just showed with the detective on the stand how they were spending their money. In particular, when court got underway this morning, the detective, Detective Consitas, started with Tylee, one of Lori's children, and it showed this active 16-year-old girl spending a lot of money going to convenience stores, shopping centers, fast food restaurants. Then the last two in-person transactions took place at a McDonald's, and then he showed these financial statements that he had created showing that the death benefits benefits that Ty Lee and JJ had been receiving were then being transferred to Lori. Let's listen to the detective on the stand. He got really choked up, Vinny, when he was talking about the financials because it really provided a timeline as to when the murders of JJ and Ty Lee took place. And detective, was there anything significant about that deposit date to you? Yes. What is that? JJ was killed a few days later. At on or around the 22nd or 23rd. And Vinny, we talked about it last night. Keep in mind that Charles Vallow had died, Lori's husband, and then he changed the beneficiary. So Lori was not going to be getting any money from that. So Tylee was getting these death benefit payments, and then she wanted JJ's as well. So in order to get those and for her to have control of that money, she needed to get rid of the children. It's, it, it, it's maddening when you think about this, like, taking your dead children's money. Like money is a motive for the death of your own children. This is sick, sick stuff. Okay, there's three people really involved here, so let's get to the second one. Um, he's not alive anymore. If he was, he'd be on trial too, Alex Cox. What do we learn about um, Lori's brother's financials? They talked a lot about his finances as well today, Vinny, when the detective was on the stand. And one of the things that piqued the interest of myself as well as many others is the loan he took out, a lending tree loan for about $21,000. The reason for the loan, he cited it was going to be medical reasons, but then there was no history of any kind of medical situation that he was using the money for. Well, what did he use it for? The purchase of guns. Let's listen to the detective talk about that. Is there anything of significance in terms of purchase history in these documents? Yes, Alex in, begins to, in, in August, begins purchasing uh, firearms and firearms-related uh, items with this account and the credit cards. And you said in August. What year was that? It's 2019. Defense counsel John Pryor, he wanted to point out on cross-examination that the defendant, Chad Daybell, and Lori never shared a joint account, but that Alex Cox, Lori's brother, and Alex, they shared the, the account. They're the ones that were commingling funds and doing things together. So he was trying to distance his client from any involvement in any suspicious financial transactions, Vinny. But then on recross, when they asked the detective another question saying, well, didn't Chad and Lori eventually get married? And the detective said yes. And then we're going to get into to that about how Lori was spending a lot of money on Chad. Um, I'm sure she was, but it is kind of interesting. Adult siblings with a joint account and sharing money. 
A little strange, not quite as strange as what they did in front of their family and parents when they were simulating sex with one another. Um, we'll get, we've spoken about that before, but no need to talk about that tonight. Let's get to, uh, let's get to Chad Daybell and, and his financial situation. And some of the things that he was doing with his money, Vinny, purchasing these prepaid uh, cards for his cell phone. So this really gave people an insight as to the affair getting going between him and Lori, the financial, the uh, romantic relationship. So purchasing these phones. Also, Lori purchasing flights for Chad. Let's listen to the detective talk about this. December 20th of 19, Rexburg PD announced the investigation. Uh, I also noted that Chad had transferred $1,000 each to three of his older children, specifically the children that lived near him uh, in the Rexburg area. On June 9th of 20, uh, we discovered that Chad had transferred $8,000 each to his, again, his three older children that lived in the area uh, the morning of the search. So in December, that is when the investigation into Tylee and JJ really kind of got underway, was announced. And that's when we started to notice Chad Daybell transferring money to his children, as you heard the detective just talk about, starting with just a few thousand dollars. And then on the day the detectives were searching his property, he was transferring $8,000 to this child, $8,000 to another child. So why was he doing that? Clearly, as he told his daughter in the video that we've played on Court TV here when he was talking with his daughter Emma he knew he was not coming back if you've got two bodies in your backyard you're not coming back it just doesn't work that way it doesn't work that way uh, the writing was on the wall he knew he was smart enough to figure that out uh, Kelly Kraft in Boise tonight another busy day thank you so much Kelly thanks Vinny and joining us today from Las Vegas Nevada host of the hidden true crime podcast and YouTube channel, Lauren Mathias. Lauren, great to see you again. Thanks for joining us. Um, money, power, and sex has been the theme of the prosecution in, in both trials here today. A lot about this money. This is, this is really sick when you really, really think about it. The children are getting money because their father, their fathers are dead, right? JJ's father shot and killed by her brother. And um, Tylee's father, dying under mysterious circumstances, right? No crime there. But then when the children go missing and the children are buried in the backyard, still getting the money, still getting the checks and using that money. This is like literal blood money. This is sick. It absolutely is. And I have to actually explain, Vinny, I'm actually in Boise, Idaho as well. And I was in court today. Oh, great. And not only, yeah, not only is it, is it, is it sick, the way Chad is acting in court is, is sick. He, he's listening to this, and honestly, he seems he seems very into his defense right now uh, because it seems like he realizes that this is about Lori's finances, which fits with his defense, and he almost seems, um, he doesn't seem to have any emotion whatsoever, you know, that, that these children were dead in his yard. It's been impossible to see any emotion. And it, it is absolutely sick to sit there in court and watch this man hear about this. You have the you have the detective choking up, right? You have the detective. But where are Chad's emotions? Where are Chad's tears? You you don't see them. You see him taking notes. You see him straightening his desk. You see all of these things, but you see no no glimpse of him understanding what you just said, which is this is sick. You know, uh, Lauren, it, it, it really is. And that was such a great observation about Chad Daybell. And yeah, you can explain, oh, he's a grave digger, he's used to death. No, he was supposed to be a man of God, a man of God. And there are children dead in your backyard and it just doesn't impact you at all. Lauren, staying with us. We've got a lot more to cover tonight, including, we're gonna take a look at two other shootings that aren't spoken about a lot but I think they're really significant plus coming up next hour.
In Dayton, Ohio, a bizarre shooting and twisted extortion plot. An elderly man is accused of murdering an Uber driver after scammers tried to extort $12,000 from him. So I shot her in the leg the first time, and I shot her in the shoulder. The guy on the phone has been trying to get uh, money out of me. We are underway in the trial of doomsday prophet Chad Daybell. Prosecutors say they will seek the death penalty against him. Investigators have recovered human remains at Chad Daybell's residence. There's no way, Morgan, I should ever come up with this. His wife, Lori Vallow Daybell, has already been convicted. Now, will her husband end up with the same fate? It's just so hard to know where the truth ends. It's the doomsday prophet, Chad Daybell, on trial. Huh. Hey, buddy, I never even got your name. What is it? It's Brandon Boudreaux. Brandon? I just want to verify only one shot, right? One shot. That you heard of and that you know of, right? Yeah. Well, the reason I'm asking is I just want to make sure it didn't go anywhere else. I'm pretty sure it's stuck in the frame there. Yeah, I, I just so. want to make sure there's nothing else that yeah. I need to be looking for either. One shot. I drove okay. Quick. They were surprised, I think, as much as I was. Okay. They probably thought they were going to hit me. I mean, it was... Okay. Point point. Unbelievable. Moments after someone shot at him, that's Brandon Boudreaux. Someone tried to take his life. Now, who is Brandon Boudreaux? Let's take a look at the family tree to try to put some context into who he is and how he's uh, connected to the family. We begin with Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow Daybell, married 2019, still married. Um, Lori has five siblings. Okay, let's take a look at the five siblings of Lori Vallow uh, Daybell. Adam Cox, he's been on the show. Alex Cox died on the toilet, but was following his sister everywhere. Summer Shiflett, uh, Laura Cox, who, who passed away as a young child, young, young baby, 1971. And Stacy Cox, who also died relatively young in 1998. Now, Stacy Cox had a daughter named Melanie. Her last name now is Pulowski, um, but Melanie had two marriages. She's currently married to Ian Pulowski from 2019 to present. He testified in the last trial, uh, but her first husband was the man who was shot at, Brandon Boudreaux, who was married to Melanie for, look at that, 2008 to 2019. Beautiful family, beautiful children. Uh, someone took a shot at him. Um, let's bring back in our guests, still with me, host of the Hidden True Crime podcast, uh, Lauren Mathias, and also joining us now in St. George, Utah, Lori uh, Vallow's uncle, Rex Connor, and in San Antonio, Texas, Lori's cousin and author of the book, I Walked Through the Fire to Get Here, and host of the Midlight Revolution podcast, Megan Connor. Great to have everyone here. Megan, I'll begin with you. Um, Talk to me about Melanie and, and her relationship and marriage with Brandon. What do we know about that? Well, by all indications, um, they had a lovely marriage and they had beautiful children um, prior to all of this transpiring with Lori. Um, I kept in touch with Melanie quite a bit on Facebook and um, tried to keep up with what she and her kids were up to. And... Uh, they just seemed to have a lovely relationship and I was really surprised actually to learn that they were getting divorced and it started to sort of have this familiar pattern to it though where we were getting kind of a story that seemed a little bit out of character for what I believed you know their marriage to be and one side of the family was not wanting anybody to talk to um, Brandon's part of the family so that kind of felt odd let's take a listen now Again, we're going back to October 2nd, 2019 in Gilbert, Arizona, um, where Brandon Boudreaux explains what happened. Okay, um, so you're heading home that morning and you turn on the street. What happens next? Um, as I came around the corner, um, I noticed there was a Jeep parked right in front of my driveway. Um, my driveway would have been um, like this, and the Jeep was just parked right directly in front of it. Um, 
And uh, as I as I was starting to drive towards it, and I would have had to make a left hand turn into it, I um, I noticed a few things that stood out to me. The first was that it. But was, what were the things that you noticed? Oh yeah, um, I noticed that it was parked really closely, um, almost touching the the van that had been parked there the previous several days. Um, it had a Texas license plate, and uh, it, the Jeep. It was a Jeep Wrangler, and Wranglers have a a, um, a tire on the back of them, and there was no tire on this one. Instead, the window was kind of hanging uh, open, but like the the little tab things were like sitting on the outside of it. Okay, um, so you you see those things about the Jeep. What happens next? Um, as, as I drove forward, the window came up and I saw a, a gun with what looked like a silencer, um, heard a bang and my driver's side window shattered. Um, and so my natural re reaction, instead of turning left into my driveway, um, I, I, I drove an electric car, so it was very instant, but I just pushed the gas and it just shot me forward. Scary, scary moment there. Unbelievable. Uh, Rex Connor, Lori Vallow's uncle, let me ask you, when this shooting takes place, is the family talking about it? Did you hear about it? I heard about it pretty quickly because the first person Brandon called was Adam. You know, you know him, Vinny, the co-host to our, our podcast, and he told Adam about it. And and we all found out pretty quickly that day compared to something like Charles being shot where we didn't find out for three days because it went first to the rest of the family that was withholding information. So, yes, the family was talking about it very much, speculating. If you remember the timing of this, everyone's scared because the media hadn't yet been very involved in that. And... So everyone is scared and concerned about the safety of other people in the family. Yeah, someone's out to, I mean, this looked like it was a hit. It was a hit that was sent, exactly. sent random. This is someone purposely there to take out Brandon Boudreaux. Let's listen to a little bit more from Brandon here, talking about uh, life with Melanie. So when we first got married, um, my my wife's kind of religious level was was kind of low. She didn't enjoy going to church. It wasn't something that she. Uh, it was it was more me pushing going to church. Uh, I, I felt like I got like a little bit of um, a benefit from it, and she didn't really enjoy it that much. In the fall of 2018, um, she started getting really passionate about going to church and about different ideas within the church. Um, she started going to these things she was calling firesides. Yeah, the the things that were, uh, she, she felt a need um, to go to the temple every single day, um, which um, is a little bit extreme and it got even more extreme. Like she would have to go during like um, our family trips to Disneyland or things like that that just were uh, very, very overwhelming. Um, she had to focus on um, on on this idea that like the world could end soon, and we needed we had a, we had a disagreement about buying ten thousand dollars worth of food storage right away. Um, th things that just seemed uh, extreme. Preparing for the end of days, Lauren Mathias. I'm I'm listening to this, Brandon talking about um, Melanie, and it's you look at the time frame and what was going on. In Lori's life as well, this this is totally in sync. Yeah, uh, one thing that we see with this entire crew is, is all of a sudden uh, they're they're religious people. You know, they belong to the Church of Jesus Christ Latter Day Saints, the LDS Church. But all of a sudden, they start to get more religious, more extreme, more intense. They start attending the LDS Temple. Every day, that's that's not church, by the way. That's different. Church is a place you go every Sunday. The temple is a place maybe you go once a month, you know, if you're, if you're a good Latter-day Saint. And so here they're now going every day, spending hours there. Children can't go to the temple. That means these these women are are leaving their children. They're they're not working. They're attending the temple. They're worshiping. And and what now happens is this giant belief system that is part plays a part of this entire case and i think one thing that's going to happen in the chad daybell trial 
is is the question of uh, whose belief system is this? Uh, how did it go from regular church attendance to this intense extremism? So, um, Megan, what, what do you see as the, the connection between Lori and Melanie, right? Um, was it like mother-daughter kind of dynamic? What was it? How much influence did Lori have on Melanie? I think Melanie did really look up to Lori as sort of a mother figure, you know, with her own mother passing away when Melanie was so young. And once Melanie, you know, sort of got back into touch with the Cox family, I think she and Lori became very close. And I think she did really rely on Lori. All right. All our guests are staying with us. We've got more to get to. Another shooting. This one, the seemingly attempted murder of Tammy Daybell 10 days before she dies or is murdered in her bed. I'm getting stuff out of the backseat of my car. And suddenly he was there and he had a paintball gun and he was okay. okay. And he was going to shoot at me. Okay, Tammy Daybell, Tammy Daybell, Tammy Daybell, Tammy Daybell, Tammy Daybell, Person? Yes. Okay, what was he wearing? He was all dressed in black and he had a ski mask on. And he's at the blinking light now is where you saw him? No, no, I'm, when I, he's gone now, because um, I pulled up into our driveway and he, I'm getting stuff out of the backseat of my car and suddenly he was there and he had a paintball gun and he was okay, okay. and like, he was going to shoot at me and I kept asking him what he was doing because I could tell it was a paintball thing and then he just kept doing it so I yelled for my husband and then he took off running around the back of my house. Okay, give me just one minute, stay on the line with me. Wow. This is 10 days before Tammy Daybell dies. Uh, I want you to, she posted about it on, on Facebook and, and one of our, our producers uh, took a look at it and, and take a listen. Okay, neighbors, something really weird just happened. And I want you to know so you can watch out. I had gotten home and parked in front of our driveway. As I was getting stuff out of the back seat, a guy wearing a ski mask was suddenly standing by the back of my car with a paintball gun. He shot at me several times, although I don't think it was loaded. I yelled for Chad, and he ran off around the back of my house. I have no idea what his motive was, and he never spoke, even after I'd asked him several times what he thought he was doing. I was just about to smack him with my freezer meals from enrichment tonight when I decided to yell for Chad instead. Strange. Let's bring back in our guests, Lauren Mathias, uh, Rex Connor, and Megan Connor. Uh, Lauren, what are your thoughts here about this paintball gun? Exactly. Paintball gun? Question mark. I actually think that this is a great example of uh, probably how Chad Daybell manipulated Tammy throughout their entire marriage. Here she is so scared uh, from this small town of Rexburg with a man pointing a gun at her after she arrives home from a church activity. She's so afraid that someone is pointing this gun at her that she calls 911. You don't call 911 when someone's holding a paintball gun. And I'm pretty sure Tammy wouldn't call 911 if she truly, truly believed it was a paintball gun. I believe that she absolutely knew it was a gun. And when she called 911 after yelling for her husband, he likely said to her and put planted this idea in her mind, it was likely neighbor hid kids with a paintball gun. Honestly, I think Chad Daybell gaslit her at that moment. And, and she's calling 911. Her brave husband isn't. She's having to make the call to 911 to report a man with a gun pointing it at her. I think the paintball gun was planted by Chad Daybell, that idea in her head. Rex, what are, what are your thoughts about this? And do you think it was Alex Cox who was the man in the mask? I do think it was Alex. And the pattern that I like to point out to people because not everyone is talking about it. Now, in the true crime world, somebody's talking about everything, <laughs> and everyone's talking about some things, but this is one that's little talked about. If you look at Alex's pattern, if he was a hitman, which most of us believe he was, he was very, 
he had very poor performance when he was the solo hitman, tam shooting at Tammy, Joe, attacking Joe Ryan with the taser, shooting at Brandon. He wasn't very successful. Now, the murders at which he had some success, I believe there were other people there and involved in all of them. He is a little bit more accountable. But I believe, yes, him shooting at Tammy was with a gun, possibly with a silencer on it, as was part of his motive. And he missed, or the gun jammed. But we, everything that comes up in this story, this never-ending story, is not coincidence. You can't just paint a coincidence brush on it and say, oh, yeah, some random kid came up and happened to, to shoot Tammy. That doesn't pass the smell test, does it? No, not where we're, I mean, we're in the middle of nowhere. It's Rex, Rexburg, Idaho. It's the middle of no, I mean, come on. Half the people that live on the street are like his kids. And, and it, it's, um, Megan, what are your thoughts about this incident? Because um, Rex is, is, is right here. You're talking about coincidences. Well, 10 days later, she's dead inside that same home where she was apparently shot at uh, in the driveway. Yeah, it's an impossibly small town, and I really don't think that there is any other explanation. And I think that uh, Rex is right. There are no coincidences in this case. And, you know, Tammy dying just a few days after being shot at, and then, you know, her body being exhumed, and Alex dying the next day, supposedly of natural causes. I don't believe that is true either. So, yeah, that, that, that's the one that <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, what was going on at his house? Who was there? Who would have access? Did he take his own life? Was he poisoned? I think all those things are possible for Alex. Uh, but Lauren, what is really clear here, and Rex points it out, is that there's a lot of, of attacks by Alex Cox that are not successful, but the ones that seem to end in death, Lori's there. Yes and no. Uh, we're going to learn that Lori was not there when Tammy actually was killed, uh, was murdered, as they now say in her. her uh, well, what are your thoughts about that, Lauren? And, do you think that's that? Do you think Alex again gains access to the house and does what Chad can't do, or does Chad do it himself? What What do you think um, is is the theory here on how this? What do happen? I think? It is a mystery, right? It is a mystery. We do know that Alex's car was parked nearby that night, a couple of miles from the crime scene, from Chad Daybell's house in a church parking lot. I do think that Chad had help from Alex. I think absolutely Chad was plotting and planning. And if, if you had to have me guess, I'm going to say that he had Alex do it only because Chad is a coward, because Chad... Chad plotted and planted his own wife's death, the mother to his five children, but he was too cowardly to do it, and so he had Alex help. You know, Rex, the other thing that really bothers me about Chad Daybell is he's telling everyone about his premonitions about Tammy. His life's going to have two segments. She's going to die before she's 50. Um, how about sitting down with your wife and having that conversation? And, and, and wouldn't that conversation be relevant if someone is shooting at her? There's, there's a whole lot more than that that bothers me about him, but I'm with you on that also, that what, what a coward. Now, I don't know that he's enough of a coward to not be present in the death of the children, okay? But definitely with Tammy, and it wouldn't surprise me if he uh, suffocated her while Alex held her down or vice versa. It wouldn't surprise me at all if you know, Alex weren't there if Chad went and picked him up, left this, his car at the church two and a half miles away. Alex waited in the car till the right time or till the signal. Nothing in this case would surprise me, but I think that's very likely that Chad would, was hands-on one way or the other in Tammy's death. That wouldn't surprise me at all. In fact, I'd be surprised if that weren't the case. So, Megan, give us a little insight here from the family. All this stuff is happening. How cognizant is the family of all these things that are going on 
um, as the rest of us in the media start to pick up on the story and realize, oh my goodness. Well, Lori and Alex did a really good job of cutting themselves off from communication with, with the majority of the family. And so a lot of us found these things out just like everybody else did on the news. Um, so it was really difficult because uh, none of us really knew the whole story. And I, me personally, of course, not being connected to Lori's family, um, I definitely was in the dark a lot of the time. I would get bits and pieces of information from some family members from time to time, but most of the time I was finding out about deaths and different uh, information uh, through the news media. I want to take a listen to the 911 call made uh, by Garth and Chad Daybell, and this is on October 19th, 2019, uh, when Tammy dies. What's going on? Um, we just found my mom. She's on the ground, frozen, or she's stiff, and I don't know. Just... Are you in Madison County or Fremont County? Hello, I'm Chad, the husband. Um, she's clearly dead. Um, oh, I'm so know. sorry. Okay. Okay, are you in Rexburg or... Your All right, Lauren, what are the biggest questions you have about this phone call, this moment, and what's going on inside that home? Uh, it's so heartbreaking to hear how uh, a, a woman, a 49-year-old woman, mother of, of five, has been found deceased and and they, they come, you know, he's crying. He's saying, oh, it's been a while. You know, she's cold. They come and they don't do an autopsy. And Chad doesn't want an autopsy. And the children don't want an autopsy. There's a, and there was, and that there was no autopsy done. This moment yes. to me tells me that Chad was absolutely involved and that this is why we are sitting in Consciousness his, his, watching guilt. his trial now. Absolutely. We're out of time for tonight, but we're going to do it again. Lauren Mathias, Rex Connor, Megan Connor, thank you so much.